You may want to turn in your Bible to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. This letter that Paul sent to the younger man Timothy to help take care of things in Ephesus, written very late in Paul's life. And one of the things Paul is worried about, you can tell from the letters of 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus, is that they continue to preach and to teach the gospel that he had brought to them and not let it be turned aside into other things. And so we're going to be talking about shipwrecked faith. You know, there's this uh, doctrine. It's a doctrine. It's a It's one of man's doctrines that doctrine is not important. Well, that's a doctrine. You know, when you have things that are so contradictory like that, you just know something's not right here. People say doctrine's not important. That itself is a doctrine. And so Paul thought doctrine was important. He told Timothy, you charge some that they teach no other doctrine. And in this text, at the end of chapter 1 of 1 Timothy, he's going to talk about some who've been teaching another doctrine and they have made shipwreck of faith. I'll probably put this picture up, a shipwreck. There's a lot of stories about shipwrecks, especially in the ancient literature. It must have been a frightening thing to get out on that sea and those little boats powered by the wind and then storms coming up. They couldn't, they couldn't check their weather on their phones, could they? Or, or use GPS to tell where they were at all. They were just at the mercy of the elements out there. And shipwrecks, you could, you could lose your ship. You could lose your cargo and you could lose your lives. But with a shipwrecked faith, You could lose a soul. Now Paul knew about shipwrecks. We read in 1 Timothy 1. Here's the text. 18. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war, a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning the faith, have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I've delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. There's this doctrine of uh, you're saved only by faith. Only by faith. That's the only thing that saves you, just faith. And a lot that hold that doctrine that you're saved only by faith. Also hold to the doctrine that once you're saved, you're always saved. Well, what about a shipwreck faith? In the parable of the sower in the book of Luke, Jesus talks about those who for a while believed. But in times of temptation, fell away. What do you do when you lose your faith? Or when you've made shipwreck of your faith? Well, then you're not always saved, are you? And here's what Paul knew about shipwrecks. In the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 11, verses 25 and 26, he's talking about all the things he'd gone through. Remember how Jesus said, I'll show you the great things you'll suffer for my name's sake. So in among those things, he said, thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day have I been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of waters, and then he says, in perils of the sea. His ship had gone out from under him three times. Can you imagine floating all day and then all night in the deep, wondering, will I be saved? I'll hold on to this board from the ship or whatever it was, and and somehow he was saved. And we don't read about those shipwrecks. It was after he wrote this that we read about a wreck he was in. It's in Acts chapter 27. And winter was setting in. And sailing was now dangerous. And because of the fast was already passed, Paul admonished them and said to them, Sirs, 
I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only to the lading and the ship, but also of our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken of by Paul. That's why we have shipwreck. That's what results in a shipwreck faith. We'll get to depending on these experts. You know, the, the owner and master of the ship, surely he knows about shipping. He ought to know more about it than Paul does. And we might pay attention to earthly experts more than the words of Paul and make shipwreck. Going on with this story. There arose against it a tempestuous wind called Eurocladon. And when the ship was called and could not bear into the wind, we let her drive. They lost control of that ship. And then fearing lest they should fall into the quicksands, strike sail, and were so driven. And we being exceedingly tossed with a tempest, the next day they lighted the ship. And the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared and no small tempest lay upon us, all hope that we should be saved was taken away. Can you imagine that? You know, we read in the book of Romans, Paul says we're saved by hope. As long as we have hope, we can keep going and keep struggling. No, I've got hope we'll get through this. But when all hope that we should be saved was lost, it's just like they're just waiting for the end to come. Acts 27, 27. When the 14th night was come. They were out there two weeks in this storm. When the 14th night was come, as we were driven up and down in Adria, about midnight, the shipmen deemed that they drew near some country and sounded and found it 20 fathoms. And when they sounded a little farther, they sounded again and found it 15 fathoms. Then fearing, lest we should fall in upon rocks, they cast four anchors out of the stern and wish for day. Now they can't see what's out there. It's night. But they can tell we're getting shallower and they can hear the waves beating against some shoreline out there. So imagine that ship now, four anchors, those four ropes holding that ship with the wind blowing them towards some unknown shore that they could hear the breakers and know it's getting shallower. And I bet they did some real wishing that night, don't you? Thinking, boy, I wish it was day so we could see what was ahead. And I think of that when I think of Hebrews 6, 18 and 19, where the writer of Hebrews would write about the hope set before us, which hope we have is an anchor for the soul. How do you get through the storms of life when, when you don't know what lies ahead, but you know it could be disaster? How do you, how do you survive those nights? Well, you were saved by hope, like, a, like an anchor. We have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the bellows roll. Then, when they'd taken up anchors, they committed themselves to the sea. We got to see. They saw what was ahead. All we can do is let up the anchors, see what's going to happen. Committed themselves to the sea, <coughs> loosed the rudder bands, hoisted the mainsail to the wind, and made toward shore. And falling into a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground, and the fore part struck fast and remained unmovable, but the hinder part was broken with the violence of the waves. The centurion commanded that they which could swim should cast themselves first into the sea and get to land, and the rest, some on boards, some on broken pieces of the ship, and so it came to pass that they escaped all safe to land. Now Paul writes about those who concerning the faith have made shipwreck. Paul knew about shipwrecks. I want you to think about the faith. What if that been the faith? And you concerning the faith, you've made shipwreck. 
He later writes in a similar manner to this. In 1 Timothy 6, verses 9 through 10, about those who fall into temptation. I guess you're worried about falling into the sea with the storm at sea. What about those who fall into temptation? Look what it says. Fall into temptation and a snare and in many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which some coveted after they've erred from the faith. What'd they do? They're looking at earthly lust, fleshly desires, fleshly lust, and the love of money, and they made shipwreck of their faith. And they drown. That's what they do. That's that same epistle. So charge some that they teach no other doctrine. You see, when you have a shipwrecked faith, it's because of a shipwrecked doctrine. Doctrine does matter. Charge them that they teach no other doctrine. Don't give heed to fables, endless genealogies which minister questions. You know, some people just love to bring up questions about which we don't have any answers to. They just think they're wise to bring up these questions. Don't do that. Focus in on what the Bible teaches that we can know. That's where we need to put our attention. Fables and endless genealogies which men are questioned. Godly edifying which is in faith is the kind of teaching we need. So do. Now the end of the commandment is charity of a pure heart and a good conscience. Faith unfeigned. Now look what they've done. Some having swerved have turned aside and the vain jangling. Now that's 1 Timothy 1.3. At the end of the chapter, they make shipwreck. So they swerve and then they turn aside and they wreck. Now, uh, I, I've done that before. When I totaled the car, something happened and I swerved. And, and you know what they always warn you about in driver school? Don't overcorrect. That's what you do. Sometime in trying to avoid one error, we go from one extreme over to another extreme. I wonder if that had something to do with Paul was saying, teaching them the law is good. You know, Paul had been teaching them, you're not under law, but under grace. And so some people think, well, we don't have to obey any law. We don't have any law. And Paul has to correct that. No, the law is good. If you use it lawfully, and so there's a lawful use of the law, and that's where they had swerved, and then they turn aside, and then they just wrecked. That's what they did. So this charge I commit to thee, son Timothy. I'm charging you. Have them teach no other doctrine. And then in verse 18, he returns. That's why they made shipwreck. It was other doctrine. This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, According to the prophecies that went before on thee. When I read about prophecies in the New Testament, my mind goes back to the Old Testament. Where were these things prophesied? Where, where do we read about Timothy being prophesied in the Old Testament? But I, I don't think that's what he's talking about. I don't know where the Old Testament prophesied about Timothy. But I do know Timothy was of good report when Paul came through Lystra and had him go with him. And I can just see it later talks about the elders putting their hands on him and for Timothy to live up to their expectations of him. And I bet they would just say, boy, Timothy, he's going to be a valuable soldier. He'll be a good soldier for you, Paul. He'll war a good warfare and letting them know ahead of time. And now Timothy you can live up to those expectations, those prophecies that went before. That You remember back home when we picked you up in Lystra and you started traveling with us. So, according to the prophecies that went before on thee that thou mightest war a good warfare. We're going to read more about warfare as we get further into the book of uh, First Timothy. And I'll bring that out. But Paul had already said to put on the whole armor of God to the church at Ephesus, didn't he? There's a warfare to fight. And sometimes the warfare 
is a fight against false doctrines. Holding faith in a good conscience. Go back earlier in the chapter. Verse 5. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart. There's your good conscience. And faith unfeigned. That's the faith you hold to. The genuine, the real, the unfeigned faith. You hold to that with a good conscience. You need to understand it. You need to be able to teach it. You need to be able to defend it. And don't be swerved and turned aside from the things that you've been taught from that faith. Hold to it with a good conscience. Which some having turned put away concerning faith made shipwreck. And then he names two of those careless steersmen, Hymenius and Alexander. And we don't know much about them. All we know about them is they made shipwreck concerning the faith. Now, some people say, well, you shouldn't use names. Don't ever call names. No, don't call names publicly. I mean, someone's out there teaching false doctrine. Some church teaching error. Well, don't, don't name them. Just talk about, but leave it ambiguous. But don't let anybody know who they are. And you got to be careful when you name names, don't you? You don't want to misrepresent. And a lot of times, Jesus and his apostles, they didn't name names. But sometimes they did. And here's a time where Paul calls them out publicly. Not only that, he writes them up. And he writes them up in a, in a document that was going to be passed around to the churches. And it lasts all the way up into this time here. Hymenus and Alexander. Paul wrote them up. And so sometimes we need to know the names, don't we? But then he said, of whom is Hymenius and Alexander? What did he do? Whom I've delivered unto Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. That is speaking against blasphemy. They're speaking against the things that Paul had taught them. And they need to learn not to do that. So I'm going to deliver them over to Satan. That sounds very severe, doesn't it? What does it mean to deliver them over to Satan? It means that we're going to let them learn the consequences of their ways. And maybe that will teach them. It's not that you want them to be lost. You deliver them over to Satan so that they might learn from the, the consequences so that they'll come to repentance. It's what Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 5 verses 4 and 5. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, this has to do with a very immoral man in that church in Corinth. He says, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together in my spirit with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such a one unto Satan. What are you going to do? Don't comfort him in his sin. No, you, you got to realize you can't, you can't fellowship with us if you're going to be this way. You got to go out and you're going to learn the hard way. You're going to suffer the consequences of your error. And why are we going to do that to someone? Are we just mean and ugly? No, that's, that's not it. It says, for the destruction of the flesh. Now, that would be not their body, but, the, but those fleshly passions and desires that have driven them into error. For that destruction, that the spirit may be saved in the Lord Jesus. We're turning them out because they're going to learn from the consequences of the way they have chosen. They're going to learn the hard way. And our desire is that if they'll learn, we're going to be here to bring them back in and welcome them home when they're ready to repent. We want their spirit saved. They're not being delivered over into Satan so that they'll be lost. They're delivered over to Satan now that they might be saved. I wonder if Hymenius and Alexander learned. I hope they did. 
I hope they got out there and learned, you know, this, this, these doctrines we've been teaching, they, they lead to no good. We've got to return and come back to the truth, and that would be our hope. It'd be great, wouldn't it, to find Hymenius and Alexander with us in glory when that time comes and say, yes, we learned the hard way, but we learned because the purpose was so that they might be saved. And so here's what we learn. 1 Timothy 1.19, holding faith or putting away faith. What are you going to do? We need to hold to the faith. We need to hold to those things that are true. We need to hold to the things that the Bible teaches. There's all kinds of theories, all kinds of doctrines of men, all kinds of philosophies and theologies that come from men. And they'll try to rest the scriptures to teach what they're saying, but they're not teaching what the Bible said. Hold to the faith and don't put that away for something else. You do, you'll make ship wake. It's holding faith or putting away faith. No other doctrine but godly edifying which is in faith is what Paul instructs. That means to preach the word. He's going to say it just as plain as he can be. Time you get to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Preach the word. And there'll be some that will be weary of hearing it and desire teachers having itching ears. But you preach the word. So that's the way not to have a ship wrecked faith. Doesn't that make you want to know what the word says? To make sure you're reading your Bible and studying it and thinking it through with all these different doctrines and philosophies out there going all different directions. And what man says is just going to lead to shipwreck. This is what's going to guide us safe into the harbor of our heavenly home. If you've suffered from the consequences of false ways, you can still be saved. You can be free from Satan. You can be baptized into Christ. And if you've been baptized, you can return. And that is what we invite people to do at every gathering while we stand and sing our invitations.